Well, for more on the economic implications of the latest Trump-Kim summit, I'm joined by Kyle Ferrier. Kyle is the Director of Academic Affairs and Research at the Korea Economic Institute of America. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. So, a lot of economists are saying that it's really Seoul, it's South Korea that's the big loser in the Trump-Kim summit. Would you agree? I think it's too early to say who's the winner, who's the loser walking out from this. I think for Moon Jae-in, who's invested a lot of political capital in the inter-Korean economic engagement, yes, it's certainly a setback, but coming out of Hanoi, looking forward, and as the two sides, North Korea and the United States, look forward to having further talks, Moon is in a much stronger position to really bring the two together. It doesn't seem as if, from the details that we have so far, from what was talked about in Hanoi, that inter-Korean economic engagement was really brought up in terms of sanctions relief. So now Moon playing a more of a mediator role between the United States and North Korea has more of an opportunity really to push these inter-Korean economic projects moving forward as a step-by-step -step move towards uh, opening uh, or lessening economic sanctions on North Korea in exchange for partial denuclearization in North Korea. And we know there are a number of projects on the table including a factory park, a tourism zone and a railway network just to name a few that are essentially in limbo because of these US sanctions. Right. How costly is having these things on hold for South Korea? It really, in the grand scheme of things, in the South Korean economy, they're really not that large of, uh, of projects. They're really meant to represent the first initial steps to opening up the Korean economy through these special economic zones through which they, they would gradually expand to uh, North Korea. So by themselves, they're really sort of um, uh, placeholders until we can get further economic uh, e opening and reform in North Korea. So as that's on hold, at least for now, how would you describe the current health of South Korea's economy? It's sort of in, in limbo right now. If you look at the most recent uh, economic data, it doesn't show that it's doing so well because of decreased exports. The South Korean economy has traditionally been and continues to be very heavily reliant on exports. And if the past year or so, they've been really buttressed. The economy has been buttressed by semiconductor exports. And then, then that has sort of dialed back recently. So the Moon government is really trying to find new new sources uh, of growth besides that, but they're also dealing with what Moon was really elected to uh, come into the office to do was reform the economy and make it more equitable and uh, improve the social welfare for people. And he's had a lot of inputs into this. The government's making a lot of efforts, but a lot of the outputs really haven't been there so far. So one of the big things has been job creation. But in January, South Korea has shown that the, the numbers out of South Korea show that their uh, unemployment report is actually uh, the highest. The unemployment rate has been the highest it's been uh, since 2010. Now we know that the country is set to have its parliamentary elections next year so given this sort of uncertainty at the moment and what's going to happen between now and then what's at stake for him President Moon? I don't want to make any predictions about the National Assembly election but I, I think for uh, President Moon his party is in a very strong position I think many South Koreans uh, still identify more towards um, the, the, the liberal Minju party as opposed to uh, the conservative party though they're making the conservative Party is making some, uh, gaining some popularity in the polls. I'm not sure if it's really going to translate into enough to really uh, challenge uh, the challenge uh, whoever would be running in the next presidential election from the, uh, the Liberal Party in South Korea. And we know that President Moon has been out in what he's calling the new Korean Peninsula regime and really promoting a peace driven economy. But in real life, what does that actually look like? So, I think what would first have to come is the steps towards denuclearization. And that's why he's, he's pushing uh, for this peace-driven regime, but he can't really uh, achieve it yet until, he, until the United States and North Korea have reached some sort of deal on, uh, on the peace and denuclearization talks, which is why he's heavily involved in that. So long term, it really can evolve in a number of different ways, but it involves a lot of inter-Korean projects and the initial steps uh, really in sort of paving the way uh, towards opening up and reforming the North Korean economy and integrating the two economies. So what do you see as the biggest domestic and international challenges for South Korea? So the biggest domestic challenge is uh, high unemployment, especially among youths, and uh, in rising income inequality in South Korea. And Moon has really been trying to uh, tackle these two issues through his income-led growth, which essentially focuses on giving more money to the people, making them work less, having uh, uh, a better work-life balance for them. So that would 
really help drive the South Korean economy uh, from the uh, from a domestic consumption level because South Korea is having issues in terms of its long-term export sustainability in, 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 is a main driver of growth because of global competition, uh, changing uh, changing patterns in global grow, uh, in global trade. So for for South Korea, those two really are intermixed. The largest uh, external versus internal uh, challenges uh, uh, go hand in hand. All right, well, certainly we'll have to keep an eye on it. It'll be a, a long year indeed. Good having you on, Carl Ferrier there from the Korea Economic Institute of America.